very significant event um, for the International Congress of Genetics. I'm Phil Batterham, President of the International Genetics Federation, and we've enjoyed an association with the Gruber Foundation in presenting the prize in our five yearly conference since 2003. And we are absolutely delighted that the Gruber Foundation has continued its association with us, and we are always excited by the amazing scientists that they honour with their prize and therefore add to the prestige of the Congress. And today we have two amazing awardees who will speak to us. Uh, Marcia. Good morning. It is with great pleasure that on behalf of the Brazilian Society of Genetics and the International Congress of Genetics, I welcome the Gerber Foundation for the 2018 Gerber Genetics Prize presentation ceremony. The SBG is proud that the Gerber Foundation has chosen Brazil to honor Joan Corey and Eliot Mayorovic for their pioneering studies that review important aspects of plant development. Besides the relevance of, for us that an event like this happening for the first time in Brazil, as a researcher working in the field of plant genetics, I feel deeply happy to be seeing researchers of this area being awarded this important prize. I'm sure that the whole Brazilian plant geneticist community joins me in the, in the joy. This community has some research that worked at the Joanne Scor and the Biot uh, in the Meru Beach Laboratories, some of them young scientists who became leaders of product groups in Brazil. So it is also on their behalf that I thank the Gerber Foundation for giving us this honor. Thank you. Bom dia. Welcome to the presentation of the 18th Annual Gruber Genetics Prize, honoring a leading scientist or scientists for groundbreaking contributions to any realm of genetics research. We are delighted to be here in Falls de Iguaçu to present the prize at the 22nd International Congress of Genetics. I'd like to acknowledge the founding vision and leadership of Peter and Patricia Gruber in establishing these prizes, as well as Peter's passing in 2014. It is an honor and a pleasure to continue their good work. We are here to recognize Joanne Corey and Elliot Myrowitz for their pioneering discuss, uh, discoveries in genetic regulatory and biochemical mechanisms underlying plant development. But first, let me tell you just a little bit about the company they are keeping. The Foundation's Prize Program, established in 2000, now presents three $500,000 awards in cosmology, genetics, and neuroscience. Each prize recognizes achievements and discoveries that produce fundamental shifts in human knowledge and culture. Last month, at the General Assembly of the International Astronomical Union in Aust uh, Vienna, Austria, the Cosmology Prize was presented to the Planck team, Jean-Luc Puget and Nazareno Mandelese. The Neuroscience Prize will be presented on November 4th at the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience in San Diego, California to Anne Grabiel, Okehide Hikosaka, and William Schultz. Nominations to all three 2019 Gruber Prizes are open until December 15th, 2018. Returning to genetics, we are proud of our illustrious laureate roster and pleased to be adding to it today. The 2018 prize recipients were chosen by our Distinguished Advisory Board, and we deeply appreciate the knowledge, commitment, and enthusiasm that the advisors bring to the judging process. We would like to thank the International Congress of Genetics and the Sociedad Brasileira de Genetica for hosting us this year. We would also like to thank the Genetics Society of America for their ongoing support of the Genetics Prize and the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award which is presented to honor, honor the groundbreaking contributions of Rosalind Franklin and to support and inspire new generations of women in the field of genetics. I would now like to introduce Udpal Banerjee, an advisor to the prize, who will read the official citation and present the scientific accomplishments of our recipients. Professor Banerjee.
official citation uh, reads, the Gruber Foundation proudly presents the 2018 Genetics Prize to Joanne Corey and Elliot Meyerowitz for their pioneering discoveries in genetic regulatory and biochemical mechanisms underlying plant development. Joanne Corey discovered signaling pathways in plants that regulate responses to environmental signals. Elliot Meyerowitz pioneered the use of Arabidopsis thaliana to study plant development and he elucidated the regulatory mechanisms underlying flower shapes and patterns. Presented this 12th day of September 2018 by the Gruber Foundation and signed by Peter, uh, Patricia Gruber. So, I would briefly uh, talk a little bit about uh, the two recipients today. Um, so good morning and welcome to the 2018 Gruber Genetics Award Symposium. It is a great privilege for me to be asked to introduce two scientists who, following their each unique ways, have revolutionized plant molecular genetics as we know it today. I have three minutes to achieve this task. <laughs> this is easily done since we are all aware of the renown and the respect that professors Joanne Corey and Elliot Marowitz command in the field of molecular genetics. Joanne and Elliot have both spent their scientific careers in Southern California. Joanne, the Howard and Miriam Newman Chair and Director of Plant Biology Laboratory at the Salk Institute, and Elliot is the George W. Beadle Professor at Caltech. They're both Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators and are both longtime members of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In addition, they have been recognized by several distinguished foreign academies of honor. Their awards are numerous and still growing. Exception within even that large selection is the Breakthrough Prize for Joanne and the Balson and Dawson Prizes for Elliot. Both are recipients of the GSA medals. Lacking from their repertoire, was the Gruber Prize, an omission we are here to rectify today. The uniqueness of the approaches of these two exceptional scientists speaks volumes of their creativity and individuality. And as a result, I'm anticipating two very different talks today, even as they are on related topics. Elliot, started his career working in Drosophila neurobiology with Doug Kanko, and during the fledgling days of recombinant DNA technology with David Hobbes. In fact, in the mid-80s, his laboratory was voraciously publishing papers both on cis and trans regulatory elements in Drosophila, and also was developing Arabidopsis as the first molecular genetic model system in plants. In numerous papers, Professor Marowitz has handled every aspect of Arabidopsis research, and although he is probably best known for his work on flower development and the famous ABC model, his research has spanned from gene regulation to epigenetic analyses, role of mechanical forces in development to ethylene and auxin signaling, and also some serious computational modeling. In the process, he has trained some of the best students and postdocs in the field in his laboratory, who have then extended their plant genetic expertise to all parts of the world and may have worked, and many have worked, on crop plants that often utilize 
similar developmental genetic strategies as their moderately distant mustard cousin. <coughs> Joanne's rise to fame followed the same impressive but quite a distinct path. With degrees from Oberlin and Michigan, she joined Fred Ausubel's illustrious lab at Harvard and ever since has been a plant geneticist, molecular biologist, biochemist, and these are all standard and interdisciplinary collections of her vast toolkit. Joanne's laboratory has done groundbreaking work in deciphering complete mechanisms of photosensation as well as in signaling by plant steroid hormones. In the former category, she has discovered how photosensation is linked to growth, including sh shade avoidance, and how circadian rhythms affect exquisite control of gene transcription in plants. Thus, transcription is sensitive to the time of the day, location, and seasonal variations. Her work on plant steroids has completely restructured our often animal-centric biased way of thinking about hormone signaling. Joanne has shown a close and direct cooperation of metabolic synthetic pathways and phototransduction and how the two can combinatorially affect gene expression. At the end of the day, plants cannot walk away from stress or grow without sunlight. Joanne's outstanding work demonstrates how plants thrive within the limitations of their environments. Joanne is also very well known for her support of young scientists and many that I know are proud to call her a role model. Thank you. And at this point, uh, I would like to invite um, Elliot Marowitz and Professor Joanne Corey to join us on the stage. Here are the medals. They've given me a few moments to say some thank yous, which is very difficult to do. I feel like at the Oscar Awards when they'll have to get the shepherd's crook at drag me off the stage if I were to thank everybody who contributed so much to this. But let me single out two groups of people. First of all, my laboratory. I didn't do any of the work that Utpal talked about. And uh, it was done by the graduate students and postdocs in my lab. And they're the ones that deserve the recognition. I'm very happy to come and accept that recognition on their behalf. And I'd like to single out my family, who've tolerated me all these years. Well, I spent late nights in the lab and, uh, and generally ignored my children uh, for 
the research that I love so much. And so without those two groups, I certainly wouldn't be here. And indeed, they're the ones who deserve all the congratulations and the award. Finally, I'd like to thank the people from the Gruber Foundation for selecting me and for putting me among the company of those fantastic heroes of mine who are briefly on the picture, who are the past winners of this award. I don't feel worthy to be among them. And those are the giants on whose shoulders I've been standing all these years. So thank you. Okay, um, I too want to thank the Gruber Foundation and I really appreciate their, um, their appreciation of genetics and fundamental discoveries that have come from genetics and for establishing this prize. I want to um, also thank the selection committee for um, allowing me to walk in the path of the previous winners, many of whom are my scientific heroes as well, including this guy, Elliot Manowitz. And so um, that's pretty exciting too. And I want to thank the um, British Genetic Society, the Brazilian Genetic Society, I'm sorry about that, and the International Congress for hosting us here. It's been a beautiful meeting for me. I've never been this far south, and so it's been a lot of fun. I want to also thank my students and postdocs, because as Elliot said, they, you guys do all the work, and you, know, and you bring glory to the lab, and I really appreciate that. And I'm accepting this on behalf of all of them. And I want to thank my mentors, but I won't go into that, my colleagues at UCSD and Salt, who created the environment that I love, people like me to do well, I think. And finally, my longtime collaborators, that includes Steve Kay, Detlef Weigel, and uh, Joe Noel, who made our science better. And um, last of all, my family, and my part-time ward, who's also here. <laughs> we call her Rob, you know, Wonder Boy. Anyway, so, Wonder Girl. Yes. And I want to thank my husband, Steve, who's really helped me a lot over these past couple of years when I needed a lot more help because you know he wasn't used to me being like that and so we had a little bit of adjustment to do there. But I think we've done it okay by now and I want to also thank my kids Katie and Joe and Daria, my part-time ward, and <laughs> for dancing to Shakira with me, making me laugh and smile and all that. So that's it for me. Thank you very much and I'm going to get to the talk now I guess. Okay, here's my talk, uh, our talk title. Elliot and I both have a project or two in our labs that uh, involved this plant hormone called oxen. And oxen, and Elliot called it the plant brain after a quote from Ottoline Leiser that I heard on public radio actually. And so I've been working in environmental responses. Elliot works on morphogenesis. And so you'll hear uh, different approaches to this hormone. So let me see. So when Elliot proposed oxygen as a plant brain, this is what came to mind for me. So as humans, we either fight or we have flight. And flight is what Elliot also calls what neurobiology is. And so you always have something involving muscles. And when you think about having to coordinate all those muscles, you can see why you might have to have a brain. Whereas plants made a decision when they went multicellular to be you know, stuck on the ground. And as a result of that, they have to deal with all the stresses in their lives as they happen. And so here's a plant, a Arabidopsis, being shaded by another plant, and also um, in the drought, too much water, or um, pathogen attack, or pesticide, or some her uh, herbivore eating it or whatever. This, this plant has also been called me at my promotion time, because I would like water and sweat, I guess. So, so. 
<laughs> okay. So how do plants fight? Sorry, I'm a little loud here. Um, they fight by using chemistry, basically. So they make a lot of different molecules. Flowering plants make over 100,000 small molecules. And they use these to fight um, the sun, for instance. So they make UV sunscreens. They also use them as plant hormones, and this is autumn is one of those. And they do regulate growth or not growth. And they also make up many of these are for chemical defense against pathogens or other um, insects, insects, et cetera. Okay, so today we're gonna focus on these small molecules helping the plant to grow or not grow. In my case, here we go. And so, this is a slide I'd like to use because it, it shows you the main plant hormones, which is only a handful. And there are all these small molecules of different chemistries. But here's oxygen over here on the left side, and brassinosteroids, the most active one is brassinolide. And then there's gibberellins, which also are involved in promoting growth. And then there's these that kind of antagonize that growth. All right. And so for oxygen, I call oxygen an information-rich molecule because it really knows a lot and it lets everybody else know about it. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. But, um, but it's involved, it, there's, research has been kind of in three areas. Biosynthesis turnover, which regulates the levels of oxygen in particular parts of the plant. Transport, which oxygen has to be transported. And signaling, and it takes part in signaling stuff. Now, the, the second two categories have been really well studied over the years, but biosynthesis was just something that you would have thought anyone would know about. Just, we hadn't really figured it out as a community. It'll be obviously, it'll be obvious why when I get to the end of my talk. Okay, so here's the question my lab is interested in. How does light get, make, make a message that comes from a photoreceptor inner cell to regulate the expression of more than 90% of that genome in the plant at one point or another. Okay, so I have three pairs of genetically identical plants, each grown in a different um, condition. So on the left, you have the body plant of a light, a light and dark brown seedlings of Arabidopsis. In the middle, you have Rodbeckia and Rosette plant, which has been given a few long day photo periods. And over on the right, you have plants that undergo in shade avoidance. And so in these conditions, you can see, just in the early stages of this, about 9,000 genes out of the 26,000 are regulated by light, either up or down. And under floral induction, I couldn't really get the right number, I don't think I, it was about 1,000, I thought. And then finally here in shade avoidance, we have about 3,000 genes. 10% of the genome becomes regulated when the light conditions change. So how does a plant take these 13 photoreceptors, of which a bunch of them are in the blue region, and they all have slightly different chemistries, and there's the red red photoreceptors, of which there are five, called phytochromes, and they take, both of these take part in the shade avoidance response, and then there's the UVH, there's the UVB photoreceptor. So we have 13 photoreceptors, 10,000 genes. How do, you, how do you connect a photon to a promoter element, right? And so we were able to do that, it took us almost 20 years, really, when you get, get right down to it. We banged our head on the wall a long time. And the way we did it was by studying this particular phenomenon called shade avoidance, which many sun-loving plants do. And so here, this is just showing you when you have a plant in full sunlight, this is the spectrum of light they see, pretty much everything. And when a plant is under the canopy around the plants, you can see they take out the chlorophyll and carotenoids, take out all the red and blue light, and there's some green light that comes through. And that is um, a very low light intensity. And when a plant senses that that's gonna happen to it, the red to far red ratio of light changes. And that is called what triggers, that's the event that triggers the shade avoidance response. And I just want to show you how important this response really is. If you look at daylight on a sunny day, if you're a plant in the middle of a field not being shaded by another plant, 
You can see you have a lot of photons on you, but you can also see that the red firing ratio is over the one. And at sunset, that drops to 0.96. You might think that's not much, but a plant can sense that. You can even sense the ratio change in moonlight. And under a deep canopy, you can see there's a huge change. And there's a kind of big change under the soil, too. Okay, so it's important. And it's divided into two phases. So in the first 24 hours when a plant becomes almost in the shade, but not quite in the shade, you see that um, you have a rapid response. And this is called the escape part of the response. And during the escape, the plant has a way to grow really rapidly and try to outcompete the plant that's going to get in its space. And the reason why it knows that plant's going to get in its space is that the far red light begins to be reflected off the cell wall of the plant. And so the fire light is being reflected, and then when the plant gets in the shade of that other plant, the chlorophyll absorbs the red light, and then you end up with a low red fire ratio. And so you have 24 hours to win. If you win, you don't have to stay in that lifestyle. But if you lose, all these bad things happen to you, and you can't get out of it. And so in general, it's not very good for fitness or yield. When the plant does it, but it's important for it propagating the root. Species. Okay, so we said this is a pretty simple response. Maybe we can do it a screen in Arabidopsis. And so here we have two Arabidopsis seedlings of about seven or eight to ten days old. And on the left is the one grown in white light, which is the whole broad spectrum of light with a high red to fiber ratio. And then we have simulated shade on the right. This is a wild type plant, so you can see this plant on the right is a lot longer than this guy, so this allows you to do a genetic screen pretty easily. So we looked for plants that were in both directions. So we thought, well, if we have negative re regulators, maybe we'll see the mutants in white light, and they'll just look like a plant that had been in the shade. So it'll be tall, okay? And if we thought we had positive regulators, we would have a mutant that in, in the shade who stayed short and acted like a wild-type plant in the white light. So those are our two categories of mutants, and we got mutants out in each category. They're summarized here, not all of them, but here's the ones I'm going to talk about today that have something to do with oxen. Okay, so shade three, that's shade avoidance, locus number three. You have three alleles, it's short in shade, but it's normal in white light. So the spe it's specific to the red to fire red ratio being low. And so in this mutant, this is published all, over 10 years ago now, is low oxygen in the shade and uh, in white light, it also has lower oxygen with it. It's about 0.6 of the wild type level. So 60% of wild type. What that tells us is that a plant needs to have more oxygen to grow up in the shade than it has necessary when it grows in good light. And so, in a way, what we had done is set ourselves up for a sensitized genetic screen. We didn't know it at the time, but this is going to help us when it's talking about options. Okay, and then we had another thing that is very similar. And that mutant turns out to be, I should have that title. That mutant turned out to be a trip amino transferase, and it encodes the first step from tryptophan specific to the IAA or option pathway. All right, PIF7, exact same phenotypes, but this turned out to be a, a transcription factor in the BHLH class. You probably heard about PIF4 yesterday if you were in the genomes book. And so, um, so this has the same phenotypes specific to the shade environment and has lower oxygen than wild type um, at all conditions. Okay, so uh, the negative regulators turn out to be phytochrome B, which is one of these red fire red photoreceptors that I'm not going to talk much about today, but it's the top of the pathway for this. And it's tall in the white light, and it's kind of normal in the shade. So in the shade, it just stays tall. So it's always thinking that it's in the shade, basically, that point. And then we have this other dominant plant, mutant, that was an activation tag in which this gene was overexpressed and increased the levels of oxygen in the plant and made it tall and under all conditions. And that encoded the flavin monooxygenase. 
So at the time, we weren't really sure exactly where that fit into the whole Oxen story. And Yen Jiao, who did the work, took it off of him. And he worked on it a lot to the development. All right, so. So let me just tell you a few facts and then I'll be okay. So, fairly in fact about oxen and shade awareness. So, one hour after shade treatment causes a more than 50% increase of free IAA, which is a major oxen in the rabbit oxen. And that was lacking, that increase was lacking in say 3 and in Pier 7. New oxen accumulated primarily in the leaves and was transported to the hydrocarbons where it promoted growth and regulated gene expression. This was kind of a surprise for us because the stem itself is capable of making its own oxen. If you want to have a rapid response and beat that other plant into the sunlight, why not just use the oxen that's already in the stem? Well, this plant, Arabidopsis, chose not to do it. And so and it's true for brassicas too. We've done a lot of work with brassica now. And so we showed that say three coated this enzyme and we actually did the biochemistry with Jonah Wells last. And finally, um, this was kind of a bummer at the time because we couldn't show, we couldn't connect this back to a change in the light environment. So we're making more oxen, but not because we did something to this gene. Okay, so the RNA and the protein levels were not regulated by light. We couldn't cause a phenotype in the rabidopsis by overexpressing this gene. So we had to do something about that. So how does this change in light quality lead to an increase in oxen? And you know a little more about oxen biosynthesis. And so this, is, this was the second group of genes, and this one gene came out of the overexpression study. And Yanda called it Yucca at the time. And Yucca is a member of, a, of an living family, member of some group of this family of enzymes, the flavonoid oxygenases. In Arabidopsis, so there's about 25 total, 11 of them are in this part of the tree. So any one of these can make more oxygen in the plant and overexpress it. So what, what, what got us interested in this again in my lab is the fact that when we tried to do the overexpression of the other in the SAY3 background, it didn't work. And that's because SAY3 was making the substrate for that enzyme we bought. And that's what it turned out to be. So here's the pathway to oxen. Everyone thought it was gonna be super complicated. It's actually really trivial. The problem why we never saw it in a genetic screen was because it's totally redundantly encoded. So say three encodes one of five tryptamino transferases in an epidopsis. And the yucks there are 11 total encodes flavonoid oxygenases. And their transcription is the light regulated step of oxygen biosynthesis. Okay, at least in this particular response. All right, so how do we know that? And it's because we've connected it all now with this protein called PIF7. And PIF7 is a member of this family of PIFs, BHLH transcription factors that are known to interact and touch cytochrome directly. All right, so here's the phenotype of two PIF7 alleles. And we got these from Peter Quayle because he isolated the first PIF. And he didn't think this was an interesting group because he never looked in the shade at what was going on. But for us, this is like a perfect thing. You can see they're short on the shade in the shade environment, on the bottom and on the top. They look like a All right, so I just want to show you that a PIF7 null is basically the same as a SAVE 3 null. And so here you can see the way oxygen is promoting growth in a hypercarbyl. And you'll see there's a there's an hour lag, and then there's a short period of growth, another lag, and then you get a lot of growth. And this is all in the first eight hours after the plant is put in shade. And so here you can see these two mutants at the bottom. They're really lagging that first growth phase where you have a little bump, and then the second phase is highly diminished. All right, so this, this plant makes less oxygen, and it's just like, Less oxygen under far red light and they are under high shade conditions. And so you're not making that extra bump you need to really get it up there. Okay, so we did a microarray experiment, and this was what pointed out the yucks to us. There's four of them that are misexpressed in that mutant background. And you need all four. That's what this slide's going to tell you at the end. Okay, you need all four in order to get the plant to grow in the shade. 
So this was a really big yaha, a yaha moment for all, because we finally connected photons to this response. And it involved oxygen, and it wasn't really a typical light-regulated gene or set of genes at all that people thought would be part of that response. And so we were pretty excited about that. Okay, so I just, do I have any more time? I probably don't. How am I doing? Anybody tell me how much? <laughs> how much? Okay, <laughs> sorry. So we have a model for the shade and voice response. And this model involves IAA that is made in the cotyledons. That's where those objectives become expressed. And it gets transported down the stem and tells a set of cells here to elongate. Okay, so we thought if this model is right, we, this experiment was done by Carl Prago and Brassica, species that had a much longer hypercolor than Arabidopsis. And so we thought um, if he removed the cotyledons, it will inhibit hypercolor growth, or at least the new oxygen won't come down and the plant shouldn't elongate. And that was true. Check here. And then we had. A gradient of oxygen response is away from the cotyledons should be observed. And he dissected those stems up from Brassica, and that was observed, check. And then he had, he had several other tests, but I'm just showing you three. He irradiated the cotyledons with low red fabric light, which is shade, and that induced the hypercotyledon growth. But when he irradiated the hypercotyledon directly, it didn't have a growth response. All right, so, check. And so, we have this disconnect now. Why is it so complicated? So in the cotyledons, 5B is expressed everywhere. And then when we looked at where oxygen accumulated, when we put the plants in the shade, this is also, this was originally done by Etel, but then Kyle was following up a lot of this. You can see here, if you look at where the blue is, that the oxygen starts to accumulate on the cotyledon margins. Okay, so that might be where the yucca is going to be. And then you get oxygen and it goes down the stem. All right, so say it goes down the stem. How, does it, how do you coordinate the stem to only elongate certain cells? And then Kyle did this kind of cute experiment like that. And so what he did was pair the epidermal layer off of a hypercotyl from Brassica. And what he found was that the oxygen response in that part of the stem was different than the internal cells. And it was also really sensitive to shade. And it included this whole subfamily of sour genes. Oh, so. Yes. All right, I probably missed this one. <laughs> All right, so this is just like skip the one this slide now anyway. And so it included this whole family of sour genes in the purple. And these are involved in growth. And so these weren't expressed in any other cell type in the hypocotyl that he could find. So specific to this part of the tissue. And I'll go back one now. And then he did a cute experiment. Oh, now I shut it off. So I'm going to do that. It's okay. Okay. All right. Where he expresses a signal transduction component that actually is defective. And so it's a dominant repressor of oxygen signaling. And what he did was express that in the protein in the phloem or in the endodermis or um, the green tissue or the epidermis. Okay, when he did that, he could show the epidermis was the only tissue that really mattered for growth. And we already knew that for brass and steroids, that's the only tissue that really matters for growth as well. So what's happening at epidermis? is um, when the plant has the big growth response, it turns on the brassic steroid biosynthetic pathway. Almost every gene in the pathway becomes upregulated. And then um, that allows the plant to have oxygen and brassic steroids together, elongate the plant. So the guess it was worth waiting for it. And we know that brassic steroids don't move within the plant. They are made where they are. So, um, so Watson had to come tell them it's time to turn yourselves on and really get a big growth response going. So, all right. So here's how the story is playing itself out right now. 
And so on the left I've shown you what I've shown you today. It was on the left, okay? So this is a, the low shade that I showed that the high shade response to red star red ratio is being low. And so we have cytochrome B as the photoreceptor. We have PIF7 as the transducing element. And we have yuccas as the major response to part of the pathway that's involved in elongation growth. Okay, so now Kara Franklin and Phil Wigger have been working on temperature responses. So when you raise the temperature of rabidosis grows in, it has the same exact response. You get this long hypercolor, elongated periodes, elongated leaves, reduced photosynthesis, et cetera. And so they think phytochrome B is, that, is, the, is the, the thermal sensor in that response. I, I think it could be true, but it might not be. <laughs> so we'll have to just kind of wait that one out. And so uh, PIF4 is the transducing VHLH and it involves increases in oxygen. And then you get the elongation response. When you diminish blue light from a plant, it actually uses different photoreceptors. It uses CRI1 and CRI2, cryptochromes, and, but it uses the same transducers that are part of the response for the, for the other phytochrome responses. And so here now you have two phytochromes that are competing for the next component, the stainless pathway. Okay, and finally, when you just get under the canopy, the energy levels are so low, oxygen levels are low, but sensitivity to oxygen is high. And this is work from Christian Fankhauser's lab. And he doesn't know what the, photo, what the photoreceptor is. He thinks it's the oxygen response that's affected rather than oxygen biosynthesis, but you still get the same response. You get hypercolor elongation. Okay, sorry. Okay, so what we showed, I think, in the last few years is that oxygen, we, we discovered the oxygen biosynthetic pathway. Yay, that was a really big result. And so, because oxygen's been around forever, you know, as a major plant hormone involved in growth, but no one knew how it was made, and now we know a lot about at least one major route to getting IAE. Okay, I think what our data shows is that growth isn't that easy to understand in a simple way. You know, you don't just make new oxygen and then you get a longer cell. Oxygen's a messenger, but it also plays a direct role and the rapid growth response of plants to nearby plants. And so I like this because it's not adding oxygen or anything. You have a real natural response. And then what that allows you to do is really look at how oxygen is moving around from site to site. All right. Not all shade is the same. So there's light quality detection that happens early in the shade awareness response, but there's also photon counting and the same photoreceptors do both. And so the pathways don't have a lot of overlap because I didn't actually mention this, but the cryptochrome blue light sensing pathway that involves the PIFs, there's no oxygen response that we can see, at least based on an RNA seq. And so it's elongating those cells by a different route. I think it's directly regulating cell wall breakdown enzymes. Okay. So now, if you look at all this, how these PIFs are integrating the environment. I said to Jonathan yesterday, how can Caroline talk about the environment without mentioning our pits? But anyway, so detection of high temperature, acclimation to cold, and multiple light signals are integrated into the PIFs 1, 3, 4, 5, and 7. They're all BHLH transcription factors. Sometimes they heterodimerize, sometimes homodimerize. And they promote germination, optimize the body plant to a particular light environment, and even control flower time. Okay. And so getting back to this oxygen in the brain, I began to think oxygen looks a lot like dopamine, which is something I take a lot of, so I think about it. But see, you have these aromatic amino acids, and you make all these interesting compounds. And that body is also made in the brain. But if you're, in, if you're a multicellular organism, you have to have molecules that can travel around and tell the other parts of your body or whatever or the plant body, what's going on. So IAA is that for the plant. Dopamine does that somewhat, and also serotonin, when it's derived from tryptophan, dopamine is derived from um, tyrosine. And so there's a lot of other molecules like this that could be similar, you know, how you get an integrated response 
of an organism from the physiological side. All right, I think that's it. So the last 10 years of my life, these are the people who did the work that I described for shade avoidance. We've done a lot of other stuff related to life, but the shade avoidance story is where we really had the big break, I think. And so uh, today I talked about work from uh, Ulus Pagmali on the cryptochrome, just a bit. Kyle Proctor did all those dissections of Rasita. And uh, Zhu Yu Zhang isolated a bunch of uh, other genes that are involved in Hobbes and homeostasis, which I talk about today. And I think we've had really great collaborators, including Joe Noel's lab, and Joe Egger's lab, and Sullivan, and Sackett, now Sackett, and Lockett, who's a computational scientist, a computer scientist. He does machine learning, and he's trying to make models for how shoots grow in different light environments with us. And also, we need to thank Steve Kay and Jose Planeta Paz, who allowed us to screen their big Yves One Hybrid Library. Yan Dijal helped us out with the yoga stuff. And Carlos Bellare is an ecologist from Argentina, who tells us when we have really crazy light conditions that this is big and very natural. And that's kind of important to know that too, so he's been a big help. And Karen Yearn has made all those measurements. And with that, I'll stop. history of contribution to the uh, field. Um, so shade avoidance has been something that the plant breeders have wrestled with. There's probably no short answer to this, but um, you know, particularly maize, uh, <coughs> it's been bred for torrents of high planting density. Um, I just wonder whether any of the, the genes that have been identified in these genetic screens have been implicated in the uh, um, genotypes that have been selected by breeders for torrents of, uh, of high planting yeah. density. So the genes selected by the breed is all affected by final architecture. And a lot of them have to do with cell shading. But it is true that basically with corn, there hasn't been a gene found by a breeder that is, um, that is involved in changing the architecture in response to the light button. So I think they have them all on these. But most crops, they don't have any. And so I, I think this is going to be kind of a challenge, though. Because you, know, you want to trick the plant to thinking it's not in the shade, but if it doesn't really have light in, a, in the right part of the spectrum, it can't really do photosynthesis of the efficiency it should be doing it. So the yield will take a hit no matter what. You would think, but then you know, there was a brassinosteroid mutant in rice that there was two genes that encoded one step of biosynthesis of the brassinosteroid. It changed the architecture of that rice and it increased yield. And that must have been all because of self-shading. And so, you see, self-shading and shade from somewhere else is somehow the plant knows how to distinguish it. And I think it's the angel that it comes in. And I also think the cotyledons have to be involved when you're shading from somewhere else. Just because you're always shading your own hypocotyledon. Seems to me. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think, you know, maize is probably not worth trying to do an experiment there, for sure. I think soybean is room for making it higher density. It just depends on the crop, yeah. Yeah, Well, thanks again to the Gruber Foundation and to all of you for being here. I will take up the second part of this talk, Oxen is the Plant Brain. Plant morphogenesis and environmental response are controlled by a common pathway. Why did we choose this topic? Well, we were asked by the Gruber Foundation to give a joint talk on the parts of our work that were comparable, and this is the only point of intersection in our work, but I think it's not a coincidence 
that our work intersects on the activities of oxen, Joanne's an environmental response, and my work and developmental morphogenesis, because oxen is uniquely situated among hormones and not only plants but animals and having a set of feedbacks on its biosynthesis on its transport on its perception and on its degradation that put it in a central role as an information processor in the organism and so that although many years ago I once swore to my laboratory that if there was one thing we would never work on in our lab it was oxen because that's what everybody else worked on it turns out it's a black hole like attractor because of its central role in coordinating aspects of plant biology and so here we find ourselves in the same field as Joanne who probably said similar things to her lab 20 years ago I was asked, yeah. <laughs> Are you in the field or not? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do is introduce a little bit about the mechanics of plant tissues because the bottom line of what I'm going to say is that oxen interacts with mechanical aspects of growth to be a central information modulator in plant developmental morphogenesis. And it's going to be a bit of a sad message for somebody winning a genetics prize in a genetics congress who's trained as a geneticist because one of the points is going to be that genes don't have very much to do with this. They build a machine and then the machine does the work afterwards. And it's one of the reasons why traditional genetic analyses have told us so little about morphogenesis, is that the genes build a machine and then they step back and it runs itself. And if you knock out the genes, the machine is severely broken. So you don't get subtle morphogenetic mutations. And if they are subtle, they're too subtle. So let me introduce first the plant shoot apical meristem, which is the part we work on which uh, is above the hypocotyl that Joanne works on. And so if you look at the tip of a shoot, there's a collection of stem cells, which pours out behind it the cells that make the stem, and on its flanks makes leaves early in the life of the plant, and then later makes flowers. And these are the flowers forming around the shoot apical meristem. And we've developed live imaging methods so that we can see cell division patterns in the shoot apical meristem and also gene expression patterns in the meristem and in the derivative organs like the flowers and so that we can watch these processes occurring in real time. So let me start by pointing out that growth leads to shape change in plants at the shoot apical meristem and shape feeds back on growth so it's one feedback that we need to know as background before I get to the oxen. Now, one critical fact that's been known for a rather long time is that the epidermal layer of plant tissues is under tension, mechanical, physical tension. The turgor pressure within the cells, which is high as much as 10 atmospheres, that's three champagne bottles worth, is uh, keeping all these cells in the plant pressed against each other, and the cell walls are shared between adjacent cells, so there's no movement of cells with respect to each other. The turgor pressure in the inner cells is not fully resisted by their cell walls and the rest of the resistance that puts the plant in mechanical equilibrium in respect of turgor is the epidermis which resists its own cell's turgor pressure and a little bit of the underlying cell's turgor pressure. So the epidermis is stretched like the skin of a balloon and that gives the final bit of resistance to the turgor of the internal cells. And that's easily demonstrated, as Hoffmeister and Sachs did centuries ago, by taking a dandelion stem and cutting it up the middle with a razor blade. And it flips out this way with the epidermis on the inside of the roll because the epidermis is under tension and sometimes so much tension that it tears loose from the rest of the tissue. Now, this stress pattern in the shoot apical meristem, because the epidermis is under tension, can be calculated by mechanical engineers is a thin-walled pressure vessel, the mechanics of which are well understood because of the development, again, two centuries ago of mechanical engineering to prevent boiler accidents and steam engines. So that we understand a pressurized vessel in great detail mathematically, so that we can take a shoot apical meristem and, for example, in a hemispherical structure, 
the stresses, which is force per unit area, are the same in all directions, they're in a sphere. But in a cylinder, it can be calculated even by me that the stress is twice as much circumferentially as it is up and down. So we can calculate the stresses based on shape. And if we do that to a shoot apical meristem, we can see isotropic, that is uniform stresses in all directions, in the hemispherical part, and in places like these valleys between developing flower primordia and the meristem, there's strong tensional stress across the valley and much less tensional and possibly even compress compressional stress orthogonal to that. If we look down on the top, it's like this. As it happens, if you look at the microtubules in a shoot apical meristem in the cells, the cytoskeleton of the cells, the cortical microtubules, which are normally arranged in helical arrays just under the cell wall or just under the plasma membrane of these cells, align themselves in particular directions, and that alignment is random in isotropic stress regions, but it's highly aligned, bundled, and stable in regions where tensional stress is anisotropic, stronger in one direction than another, and strong enough, such as in these valley regions, so that if we look at the microtubules of the Shudepical meristem, at the top of the meristem, they can be in any particular orientation, and in fact, those orientations change rapidly every tens or twenties of minutes. But if we look at the regions that are under anisotropic tension, the microtubules are bundled and they're always parallel to the principal maximal direction of stress. So we have a tissue that's under stress. We have a pattern of stresses that are different in different parts of the tissue. We have a cytoskeleton that gives us a meter to read out this stress pattern. And if you don't believe it's stress and you think maybe it's something else, here's an experiment with live imaging where if we use, uh, in this case, just a pin, and we poke a hole through the epidermis, the hole starts to spread larger because the epidermis is under tension, and you can see the microtubules going from random alignment to strongly aligned and bubble, circumferential to this hole in an hour or two. And so that we change the stress pattern, just as our models would predict, we change the microtubule pattern in an exactly predictable way. So there's the mechanics. It reads out in a particular way, which is that the cellulose synthase complexes, which run along the microtubules' tracks, project cellulose out into the cell wall through the plasma membrane, and those cellulose fibrils, which have an elastic modulus, something like that of steel, elastic modulus is stress divided by strain, how hard you're pulling on something, divided by how much it stretches when you pull on it and cellulose is extremely stiff, so it has a high elastic modulus. It's, pushed the wrong button, it's, uh, runs along the microtubules and reinforces the cell wall in the directions of the microtubules. That is in the principal maximal direction of anisotropic stress. Because that stress is then resisted, the stress pattern changes, the microtubules change, the cellulose direction changes, the stress pattern changes, and on and on and on in this feedback network. And so what we have is a mechanism where stress is generated by tissue shape and an epidermis and tension. The mechanical stress controls the cytoskeleton and the cellulose direction in the walls. The cellulose controls subsequent cell expansion, which in turn changes the stress pattern. And so we have a novel developmental mechanism where tissue shape can be sensed locally by cells. The, the tensor field of, of stress is sensed locally by cells, which respond locally to this global stress pattern, which leads to future changes in tissue shape. So we finally have a basic mechanism for morphogenesis, which involves a complicated set of feedbacks through mechanical force. Okay, so now we're introduced to the mechanical forces in tissues and we come to oxygen. One last thing I'll mention before getting on to that is that the planes of cell division in the meristem are also controlled by stress by the same mechanism because these helical arrays of microtubules collapse to what's called the pre-prophase band and that directs the positioning of the next cell wall to form and so that if you change the stress pattern, you also change the pattern of cell division, which again is something that was known in the 19th century 
and now explained by this interaction between cell biology and stress barriers. So now let's get on to mechanical regulation of morphogen transport, which is the oxen part of the story. And in this part of the story, what we're trying to understand is an aspect of developmental morphogenesis, which is philotactic pattern. Flowers are made in the shoot apical meristem, around the shoot apical meristem in a Arabidopsis plant, in a standard spiral pattern, which is the modal pattern of Philotaxis in plants, though there are many others, where each individual primordium is made 120 or 130 or 140 degrees circumferentially from the last one, and that goes over and over again, giving this beautiful pattern we see in the middle of sunflowers or in cacti or in pine cones and so on. That we all learned in school has something to do with Fibonacci patterns, which it doesn't, but that's another seminar. It's not the only thing we learned in school that was wrong. Now, the origin of this philotactic pattern is auxin, and this has been known since the 1930s. That is, high concentration of auxin specifies the position of each subsequent flower primordium as it finds. And this was shown by Robin and Mary Snow by applying drops of auxin in sheep's lanolin to shoot apical meristems of various types of plants, which they did in the 1930s. And when they put a drop of auxin in a new position in the appropriate part of the meristem, they would get a new primordium form, which shows that high auxin is causal in the formation of these primordia. So if we want to understand philotactic pattern as a morphogenetic aspect of developmental biology, all we have to do is understand how it is that auxin gets to high concentration at the positions where the flowers will come out two or three days later. It turns out that the way this happens is due to a peculiar property of auxin. It's not the biosynthetic control about which Joanne talked, but it's control of transport of auxin. We haven't even gotten to perception and degradation yet. And auxin is trapped in cells in a peculiar way. It's a weak acid, and in the neutral cytoplasm of a cell, it's largely dissociated from its proton, so that the indole acetate is an ion, and that will not go through a plasma membrane. So auxin is acid-trapped in cells. The way it gets out is through a protein, which sits in the plasma membrane, or collection of proteins, auxin efflux carriers, which allow this ionized auxin through the plasma membrane when it gets into the cell wall, which is at an acidic pH because of the action of proton ATPases in the plasma membrane, it's reassociated with its proton, and then it can diffuse through the plasma membrane into the next cell or back into the cell of origin. So once it's out in the wall, it's a diffusion process, and there are auxin import carriers, but they only facilitate, don't allow auxin re-import. Once the auxin's back in the cell, it can't get out again until it encounters an auxin efflux carrier. So if the auxin efflux carriers are asymmetrically distributed in the plasma membrane, for example, in a line of cells, so that the auxin efflux carrier is only at the bottom, when the auxin comes out the bottom, it can either go back into the cell in which it started, and it can only exit out the bottom, or it can go into the next cell, and then it can only exit out the bottom of that cell. So it creates a net flux of auxin in the tissue. So the asymmetric distribution of the auxin efflux carrier creates a pattern for the net flux of auxin in the tissue. So the auxin has a private circulatory system, unlike any other known hormone, in which it can be circulated through the tissue in a pattern, not only through diffusion, which is occurring, but also through transport, which is activated by a pH difference, thermochemical. So auxin induces new leaves and flowers. It's trapped in cells and gets out through special mechanisms. It causes change in, in gene activity through action through a nuclear receptor. And it also causes shoot cell expansion because essentially the earliest change that auxin causes in gene activity is a set of changes that leads to the weakening of the cell wall the reduction in its elastic modulus, so the wall starts to expand with the turgor pressure in the cell. So when you put auxin in a cell, that cell weakens its wall and the wall starts to expand, so there's a mechanical effect, there's a gene activity effect, and the auxin is traveling through the tissue with its own private circulatory system. Now, the clue to philotaxis came from work that was done by Kiyotaka, Kiyotaka Okada's lab, the 1990s, in which they found a mutant where new flower primordia are not made. 
and so you get a pin-shaped sheet apical meristem here with no flowers around it and work in uh, Jerry Fink's lab, among others, a previous winner of the Gruber Genetics Prize, uh, showed that PIN1 encodes the relevant auxin efflux carrier in the sheet apical meristem. So the way Philotaxis works is somehow through auxin transport control. Marcus Heisler, who is here at this meeting and deserves many acknowledgments for starting this work in my lab, and we still are collaborating closely in this work, as you'll see, uh, showed that the pattern of asymmetric distribution of the PIN1 auxin efflux carrier in shoot apical meristems is extremely dynamic by doing live imaging of a fluorescently marked PIN1 protein and that it aims initially towards the positions where new floral primordia were formed and then eventually away from those positions so it directs auxin to particular points in the shoot apical meristem and then, then directs auxin away from points in the shoot apical meristem. So that it's this dynamism of the auxin efflux carrier that leads to the philotactic pattern and that's what we have to understand. So by studying it, Marcus discovered three things, that high auxin concentration causes new primordia, and that was shown by the snows, and it gets high locally by transport and diffusion, as shown by Okada and Fink's work. Auxin efflux carrier moves auxin, and its gene is auxin-induced, and that's something Marcus showed, so that the rate of auxin transport is positively controlled by auxin levels. That is, if you're a cell that's high in auxin, you spit your auxin out to your neighbors at a much higher rate than a cell that's low in auxin would do. So the rate of transport from a cell depends on auxin level in the cell. And then the auxin efflux carrier is polarizing cells and points towards neighboring cells, as it turns out from Marcus's work, towards cells' neighbors with the highest auxin concentration. And that's what Marcus discovered. And so we take these facts that the auxin is always moved out of a cell up the auxin gradient towards the neighbors with the highest auxin concentration. That auxin weakens the cell walls, which we'll come to in a minute. That the auxin efflux carrier is moving auxin around in a very lively way. And we come to a set of feedbacks which are beyond the human mind to comprehend. I'm a cell and I'm high in auxin. The first thing I do is I look at all my neighbors. I identify the neighbor that has the highest auxin concentration I put my auxin efflux carrier on the plasma membrane adjacent to the wall I share with that neighbor, and I start spitting my auxin out at a high rate towards that neighbor, out into the wall, where it can diffuse back into me, it can diffuse into the neighbor, it can diffuse laterally in the wall into some other cells. Eventually, I pump my auxin out, now I'm low in auxin, I turn down my auxin efflux carrier, my neighbors start to spit the stuff to me. So it's beyond human comprehension to figure out whether these feedbacks could be relevant in morphogenesis. But it's not beyond the comprehension of a plant. So all we had to do is collaborate with mathematical biologists and translate these three statements into the language the plants speak, which is this, <laughs> and then see whether this is sufficient to explain the philotactic pattern. And this is, these three statements are exactly this. That's the part that's happening in the wall, which is most complicated. That's an, an individual cell, and that's the pin one directing to the neighbors and the amount of pin one. So if we apply these equations to a substrate that looks like a bunch of dividing cells in the shoot apical meristem, we get exactly what we see in the tissue. So yes, this explains the philotactic pattern. There's more, but fundamentally, this is how it happens. So auxin is creating morphogenetic pattern through feedback on its own transport. That's very brain-like, it's computational. There's a problem with this model that I'll mention in just the remaining few minutes, which is that the auxin efflux carrier is polarizing cells and points towards neighboring cells that have the highest auxin concentration. Now, an auxin efflux carrier is a nuclear thing that measures the amount of auxin in an individual cell. How does the cell know how much auxin its neighbors have? And there have been various proposals along these lines, many of which involve cell surface auxin receptors, which don't exist and mathematically cannot explain this. And I could go into that, but I won't. But the laws of mass action preclude that being a mechanism. What happens 
is it turns out it's a mechanical response. If we look at the growth of cells in the shoot apical meristem, as we pointed out before, where auxin is high, the cells expand more. They're expanding relative to their neighbors, to which they're connected. And so in addition to the overall tensional stress in the epidermis, there's a local stress created by cell expansion that puts stress on the walls to the neighboring cells. And it turns out it's that stress which is read out by the cells and causes them to send their PIN1 auxin efflux carrier to the plasma membrane adjacent to their most stressed wall. And that's how they read out the auxin in the neighbors. And a bit of evidence for that is Here's a computational model of this happening. If we poke a hole in the epidermis, now we're artificially creating some new st st uh, stresses because the hole tends to expand because of the tension in the epidermis. And as Marcus showed in the laboratory years ago, if we actually really use a laser to kill these three cells starting there, then we can watch the pin one move from to the outside of these cells and then the outside of these cells and the outside of these cells as the stress pattern changes in the tissue. Now you might say, well, that's some sort of a wounding response, but we can take a bead with cellulase, which weakens the cell wall by a mechanism different from auxin, and we can put the bead right there, and then 18 hours later, when we weaken the wall, we see a complete, after we weaken the wall, we see a complete redistribution of pin one, exactly as predicted by the weakening of the stress pattern. And indeed, if you look carefully, a change in the philotactic pattern that results after that when these the pin one goes back to its new post-treatment situation when we allow the wall to strengthen again. And so mechanical stress controls auxin transport, controls morphogenesis. And so now auxin causes cell expansion, which results in mechanical stress, controlling auxin transport from neighbors. New auxin peaks change which cells are expanding because the auxin is moving around all the time thereby changing the oxygen flow again. And so yet another novel developmental mechanism, regulated transport of a morphogen. And oxygen was the substance for which Turing coined the word morphogen in the 1950s. So that's the story, a peculiar story for genetics Congress, because as you can see, all these feedbacks and all this action is put in motion by genes. The gene activity changes don't come into play in this uh, flower development until after the auxin changes the pattern of gene activity to start activating new genes to create floral pattern. And so genes are invoked before this process and after, but this set of processes occurs in the middle, made by a mechanical machine that the genes created. Now I'm going to show just a couple more slides, but I won't go far over time, I'm already over time, uh, to point out one more parallel between the brain and auxin, because it turns out and uh, the central commonality of the brain is that all sensory inputs are turned into electrical stimuli. Those electrical stimuli are sampled sparsely and modulated by the brain and then fed back out electrically to a response system, which is a muscle through motor neurons. And so electrical activity is central to the brain. And there's nothing electrical about anything that either of us have said so far about auxin. But one thing I'd like to point out is if you look on the left, if you poke a meristem and change the mechanical stress pattern, there's a wave of potential of calcium cytoplasmic changes that proceeds all the way across the meristem, which you saw there. And when you withdraw the needle and create another mechanical change, you get another wave of calcium going across right there. And these are in the presence of inhibitors of calcium responses. So it's another mechanical response of the tissue, which is very brain-like indeed, because it involves movement of electrical signals or, or ion potential signals across the meristem that involves stretch-activated calcium channels in the plasma membrane, much like the ion channels that are responsible for action potentials. Can model this too, but I'm not going to get into the models. We have a certain level of understanding of what's going on here, and it's very brain like indeed. Now, the reason I bring this up is because if we pre treat with a blocker of this cytoplasmic channel, this uh, calcium response, and then we poke a hole in a meristem, we don't get any realignment to the pin one that we would normally get. 
that is this electrical stimulation has to precede the movement of pin one to the appropriate part of the plasma membrane in an individual cell. So the initial signal seems to involve electrical activity just as in the brain. And if we wash out the lanthanum chloride without re-stimulating, then the pin one can find the stress pattern change and move to the right part of the cell. And even more importantly, if we poke a hole in the meristem and then we treat with lanthanum chloride and block the calcium response, it has no effect at all on pin one. So it's not the later aspects of the pin one response that are being controlled by this calcium response, it's the initial sensing of the mechanical stresses. So with all that, we come even closer to auxin looking like the nervous system of a plant and integrating morphogenetic responses in a way that a nervous system might in an animal, though the inputs are mechanical, not electrical, and the outputs are mechanical and not electrical. The mediation in the middle is gene activity and electricity, just like in animals. So I'd like to finally acknowledge the current members of my lab, the past members who did this work, and two critical collaborators for all of the work I've talked about. One is Marcus Heisler, now at the University of Sydney, who started this work in my lab, and we're still working on it together. This calcium work is joint work between our two laboratories. He's here at the meeting, so if you have any questions, you should ask him. And Henrik Janssen, a former theoretical physicist, now at the University of Cambridge in the Sainsbury Laboratory there, who is with me and with Marcus, been working on this project from the beginning, and all those differential equations are his uh, responsibility. So you can email him if you have any questions about those specifics. <laughs> thank you very much, and thanks to the readers. Somebody will have to tell me if there's enough time for questions, Sarah? Two minutes worth of questions, or maybe two questions, if there are any. But I realize I'm standing between people and their coffee here. So, how come transcription factors, which are large and charged, can go from one cell to another, but oxygen cannot? Oxygen can go from one cell to another. It's, pumped, it's, it's trapped, it's let out by the oxygen efflux barrier. But the way the charge goes from one cell to another, we think, and we haven't proven this, but our hypothesis that is in the model is that the calcium ions go through plasmodesmata from one cell to the next, channels that connect all of the cells. Oxygen will also go through those channels, but at such a low rate compared to the transport mechanism that it's irrelevant, as has been shown by Eric Kramer. And so that the calcium moves from cell to cell, and that's part of what, and then the calcium channels are themselves calcium activated. And so it's almost an action potential. Joanne has a question. All right. I'm going to draw this out. Well, I'm going to get my water then. <coughs> okay. Keep it just hot. I'll, I'll repeat it. Is the cell big enough to be a sink for oxygen? Yeah, because there, do you mean is there a gradient of oxygen in a cell? Is that it? Or? No, I mean if you're if you're transporting all your oxygen up to the cell that has the most oxygen, yeah. then you become a sink, right? And all the other stuff wants to yeah. be Well it is for a while, but since it induces its own pin one and because of some other things, it eventually starts to send its oxygen back to the neighbors, even though it's the highest. So it's, a, it's not a permanent sink. There's, that's a positive feedback on oxygen level in the cells, but they're also negative feedbacks. And they're, they have different time courses, and so they result in oscillations, which, which are the flowers. That's all flowers are, oscillations, in a, in a, computa in a set of differential equations. OK, thank you very much. This concludes the Gruber program. Thank you all for joining us.